Welcome to Back to the Bible. There are no do-overs in this life, and that makes the message of the gospel extremely urgent. So today, Pastor Nat Crawford equips you with some starting points for sharing the good news. After the message, Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney will be on hand to share some practical and encouraging perspectives. You know, here at Back to the Bible, your spiritual journey is our number one priority. That's why we offer so many biblical resources free of charge. Now, there are costs involved, and because of that, we're very excited about our September Challenge Grant. This grant doubles the impact of your gift through September 30th. So please call today, knowing that your donation will go twice as far. To show our thanks, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward. This new fall issue features three months of daily devotions to keep you engaged and growing in God's Word. Request your copy today at 1-800-759-2425, 1-800-759-2425, or give online at backtothebible.org. Now, let's join Pastor Nat for today's study. Hesitant. Terrified. I think this is how many of us feel about going and sharing the gospel. When I bring up evangelism, the gospel, and outreach, what emotions do you feel? I know you had some reaction when I said evangelism. The gospel, outreach, what did you feel? Uh, What scenarios played out in your mind? If you're like many of the people I have pastored, you may be hesitant and just a little bit terrified. A number of years ago, I was looking for a video on YouTube. It was in regard to, I think, fear and evangelism. And what I discovered was there was this interview between David Platt and Francis Chan. Now, if you don't know who they are, let's just say they are the evangelists of evangelists. And what they admitted in this video shocked me. They both admitted to being hesitant and at times fearful about sharing the gospel. Why do I share this with you? Why do I remind myself of this? Because even if you are passionate and have the gift, it still can be intimidating and cause fear and anxiety. So what is it about sharing the gospel that causes us such fear? It's almost as if we feel we are selling life insurance. Uh, Now, I apologize for any life insurance agents out there. I'm actually a recovering one myself. Early in my 20s, I did it, and it was one of the hardest jobs ever. I was terrified every day to pick up the phone. But in all seriousness, what is it that prevents us from sharing the gospel? Now, I'm just curious. In the past year, have you seen a great show, a great movie, had a great meal? I bet you did. Did you talk about it at work the next day? Did you share with someone at church about that movie, that show, that restaurant, or experience? Who else did you tell? Chances are, if it was that great of an experience, you told everyone. You gotta see this movie. You gotta go see this show. It wasn't even maybe a pure flicks film, a Christian movie, but you promoted it because for some reason it touched you, it inspired you, it was just awesome. But you told them because you thought they would enjoy it or it would be beneficial for them to experience or see or taste. Here's the thing. Do you know what you've done? By telling people about the restaurant, by telling people about the movie or the show, you have just evangelized. You just engaged in evangelism. You were passionate. You were a street evangelist. And I would bet that they took your suggestion seriously. Here's the question for us all. Why are we not doing the same thing with the gospel? We are so quick to promote and evangelize trivial things. Movies, 
food, drinks, vacation spots, books, auto repair places, you name it. These serve temporal purposes and are truly subjective in nature. So what is it in our thinking and beliefs about the gospel, a truly objective proposition that keeps us from sharing it? This is what I want to talk about. I believe that today that there is a true urgency to share the gospel. But as we've talked about here briefly, I don't think people are in a hurry to do this. There is a lack of urgency. We seem to think we can love on a person for an unfathomable amount of time. I can play Xbox with them for a year before maybe sharing the gospel. I can have dinner with them once a month for 12 months, and if it kind of feels right, I might bring up that I go to church or I might bring up part of my testimony, and if I'm really audacious, I might share the gospel. Some people only want to tend the soil, show some love, do an act of service, a random act of kindness, without any pressure of speaking about the gospel. Now, that's nice. It leaves everyone feeling good. But here's the problem. It stops short of sharing real hope. Most people, when pressed, they tell me, Nat, it's easy for you to say. You're a Bible teacher. You're a pastor. You are clearly an evangelist, and I am not. Do you know how I respond? I tell them, those things may be true. In fact, I think they are true. You may not be an evangelist. I may be. But friend, you are called to evangelize. You see, it is my prayer that at the end of our time together, you will understand and embrace the reality that time is running out to share the gospel. We have to develop urgency. So here's where we're going to start. I want to look at some biblical truths to help motivate us to getting out there and sharing the gospel. Biblical truth number one is we are all sinners who are in need of a Savior. We are all sinners who are in need of a Savior. This is exactly what Romans 3.23 says. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, right from the beginning of life, we are faced with a dilemma. We are all sinners. Think about King David. Do you remember what King David wrote in Psalm 51? In Psalm 51, he was wrestling with his sinfulness. He, he was asking God for forgiveness. But listen to his own words beginning in Psalm 51, verse 3. He says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Do you hear what King David just said? He said, from the very moment, David was a human and he had a sin nature. That's true for him, and it's true for you. I think this is a good time to bring in my discussion partners, Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney. Arnie, I'm just curious. You would agree that not all of us are evangelists, but yet we are all called to evangelize. How have you embraced and come to terms with that in your own life? You know, that, that's a good one, because I really firmly believe that there's no evangelism without discipleship. So really, we're called to be disciple makers, not dump and run. So we need to be there for people. And that changes, that perspective changes, because then you're not thinking of, oh, I got to pitch people, or I've got to drop off this track, or it's more of a way of living. And I really had to work on myself with that. Now, I know technically that, yes, somebody can become saved, and they haven't been discipled, and they die, right? I, I totally get that. But practically speaking, 
and there's no evangelism without some kind of discipleship, at least in my mind. So uh, it's a big deal to be there for people as a disciple maker. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people push back against that notion of uh, something more than just a yes on a on the dotted line with Jesus, right? Jesus is the golden ticket to heaven, but anything else that comes, you know, hey, great, if not, so be it. Some people point to the thief on the cross, right? There was no discipleship on the cross, and there was no formal repentance on the cross, and, and I think that's com- actually completely false when you look at it. But if we're going to do it right, If we're going to do it as Jesus did it, as the apostles did, we're going to be investing in people's lives, sharing the verbal gospel with them, and imparting on them the truths of Scripture and walking with them so that they can fully pursue Christ and then go on and make disciple-making disciples. You're exactly right. Kara, I want to turn to you now. Let's talk about Romans 3.23 because it's a very controversial verse because most people today, they don't believe in sin. Well, as someone who evangelizes, How do you approach this topic of sin? Well, we can't deliver good news unless people recognize that there also is bad news. Mm -hmm. So you have to deliver the bad news that we're sinners and that we can't make it to heaven on our own merit. So we have to be willing to discuss bad news. And I basically open conversations with this example. And believe me, it takes a little bit to get to this point. But then I say, you don't have to teach a child to be selfish. Hmm. And I feel like that puts the whole enchilada into perspective, right? Because you don't have to teach a child to be selfish. We're born selfish. Well, it's like gravity. You can deny the reality of gravity, but once you jump off a roof, you're going to hit really fast. And the same is true for our sinfulness. We can call it a mistake. We can call it a boo-boo. We can call it nothing at all. The reality is when you face consequences in your life, you really do realize that there is something out there that is sin. And I think when we take time and talk with people, and you're great at asking questions, both you and Arnie are are really good at asking questions. I think a lot of times people come to those truths on their own, but it takes some time and some nurturing and some walking alongside them. But by no means should we as Christians, as pastors, as evangelists, everyone who's a follower of Christ, we need to be committed to showing and sharing the whole story the good news and the bad news. Because as you said, without that bad news, what's the point of good news? Challenges, you have plenty of them in your world, but nothing can keep you from growing and going. That's the title of Pastor Nat's current series and the theme of our September challenge. You see, several ministry friends have offered a $130,000 challenge grant, which must be met by September 30th. Their support, coupled with yours, will help this ministry keep growing and going, reaching out to a hurting world with the good news of the gospel. Again, this generous grant will double the impact of your contribution today. And to show our thanks, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward, Daily Steps for Your Spiritual Journey. This is our brand new fall devotional book featuring three months of fresh new daily devotions to help you stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word. Request your copy today at 1-800-759-2425, 1-800-759-2425, or make your donation online at backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Now, here's more of today's message with Pastor Nat Crawford. 2 Chronicles 6.36 tells us, There is no one who does not sin. Do you realize, since the creation of man, mankind has been sinful? Do you think someone can actually go through life without sinning? If you do, think again. Now, you're smarter than that, but there are people who deny that reality. But here's what I tell them. Just go and observe children. Parents don't instruct their children to be naughty. There is no Sunday school that exists to instruct kids on how to be bad because sinfulness is innate to their nature. We all need instruction on how to be good and not bad. Again, if you don't believe me about the little kitties, just go in a daycare or when churches are fully functional again, go work in childcare. 
Trust me, I have three wonderful boys. They may look innocent, but I will tell you that they are not. Listen, what happens? What happens when you take two little kids and put them in a room together? One's playing with a transformer and the other kid doesn't have one. What do they do? The kid without the transformer goes and he grabs that transformer and he pushes the other kid away and he takes off running and he hides. Well, the little boy who just got robbed, guess what? He's not going to take it. He wants his toy back. So he goes running off towards the kids. He finds him. He punches him. He takes back his toy and he says, I am the man. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that those kids were taught how to be naughty, how to steal, how to hurt, how to go and seek revenge? No, of course not. They did not need to be taught to be naughty. They do not need to be taught to be sinful. That is in their very nature. There is no one who does not sin. This is true for non-believers, and we know it's true for us. 1 John 1 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. I get it. Sin has become a very unpopular term. In our politically correct culture, uh, we don't call sin sin. We don't even talk about sin. Our, our culture, what has happened is we have drifted towards moral relativism. We deny sin. There are no sins. There are mistakes. Again, there are boo-boos. There are maybe things that I don't like, but surely not sin. So when you and I go to a non-believer and we say, hey, stop doing that thing, it's sinful. What's the response? Hey man, you can't tell me that's a sin. My truth says I can do this. In fact, it's good for me to do this. I see this even in Christian circles today. It's not just an issue with non-believers. But what's the issue? The issue is relativism. According to the culture, truth is relative. This is what makes evangelism so hard today. But it also makes discipleship and sanctification so hard for many Christians today as well. As someone who has pastored people of all ages, I know that this is a prevailing belief that we can be a Christian on Facebook, at least by title, and we can be a Christian at church, but what happens in our personal lives doesn't seem to matter. In fact, here are some of the things I have heard in my time as a pastor. People say, I can go out, I can go party with my friends on the weekend. I, you know, pastor, I don't get that drunk. I hear things like, well, I can live with my girlfriend. I can live with my boyfriend. I mean, come on, pastor, you got to try it before you buy it. Maybe you've heard this. I, I can take whatever I want from the supply closet. I just don't get paid enough here anyway. This will slowly bring my pay back up. Friend, this is the mindset of the culture we live in. Relativism. Truth for you and truth for me. Justification of our sins. Just think about some of the sitcoms today. Who are the heroes? What is praised? Well, it's the alternative, adulterous lifestyles that are so popular. They're the ones that the culture celebrates. They're the ones that people promote. The person? The person who gives it to the organization, who robs, who steals, who tries to destroy reputation, that is the hero. Today in our world, Bad is good and good is bad, though they would all just say it's all good. This is why if you profess to be a Christian, you cannot hold to relativism. Why? Because absolute truth is not relative. It is objective. You see, you're either a Christian or you are not. 
You see, just like you cannot be kind of pregnant or kind of dead, you are either pregnant or not, dead or alive. So for Christians, we have to hold to truth. And when I say truth, I mean true truth. And the primary source of truth is the Bible. You see, this is true regardless if you're a Christian or not. But we know, even though the Bible is true, to a non-believer, it is foolish. It's foolish. And yet we know that the Bible provides freedom and life. It is a life-giving blueprint. So as Christians, we are called to be people of a book, to live by the standards of God, not to earn salvation, not to keep salvation, but because we love God. That is why we don't get to exploit the grace of God as a Christian. We don't get to argue. We don't get to negotiate what God asks of us. Here's something I do with people who want to push back against God's standards. I simply ask them a question. I ask them, how well are your choices working for you? This is a powerful question that gets them to stop and evaluate their current lifestyle, their current choices, and the results of those choices. Here's what I've discovered. When people stop, and evaluate their lives, when they stop and evaluate their choices. More often than not, when they are going against God's design, they will admit not too well. And then I ask them, do you know why? And I tell them, it's because your choices are actually sin. And do you know what sin does? Well, Romans 6 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. It's death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin results in messing up everything. But the ultimate price of sin is death. It's not just physical death. It's spiritual death as well. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Your sins have separated you from the one who can love you unconditionally. Separated from God, you are neck deep in your sin, and even in the pain and suffering, you can now cry out to God for help. But unfortunately, if you are estranged from God, He won't hear you. By hear, it doesn't mean that He doesn't actually hear. It just means He is not inclined to answer. Do not think just because God is estranged from you that He's not aware of your actions. God knows all. The sinful actions that you do are not just hurtful and offensive to men, they are ultimately offensive to God. And God, He is good. And because He is good, He will not let sin go. Sin is serious business to God. It is so serious that He would send His one and only Son to the cross to pay for it. Again, biblical truth number one is we are all sinners in need of a Savior. That right there should motivate us to go out and share the good news. But if you need another truth, the second biblical truth is that there are no do-overs. There are no do-overs. Have you ever died and been reincarnated? Well, I hope you said no because no one ever has. That just doesn't happen. The hard truth is that there are no do-overs. This is the only life we have. Jesus was very clear in his teaching on this one shot on earth. Now, I'm going to read you a lengthier passage from Luke 16, but Jesus here shares a frightening but necessary story. 
There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And beside all this, Between you and us, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. All right. It's a good time for me to turn to my discussion partners, Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney. What does this teaching of Jesus do for you as you think about reaching the lost? It's like, wow, how awful, how terrible. Um, And, and you, it's almost, at least for me, you have the desire to make it be like a a fairy tale because to want to go, and reach your other friends, it's just in the desperation. It it just has a tremendous impact on the loss. And I, and I think, and maybe it's Satan. He really can't let us think that this is literally a true story, because if it was literally a true story, we would behave much differently hmm. than how we do today. How most of us, including myself, behave today. That's great perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. When you read the commentaries on this passage, some people think it's a parable. Some people think it's a real story. Uh, But I think one thing is really unique about this is the fact that Jesus never used names in parables, and yet he uses Lazarus here. That gives us a a hint that there may be something more than just an analogy here, but actually this is a, a reality, something that is going on. And I think you're exactly right. Satan will do whatever he can to take our eyes off of the truth. And this is a scary, shocking story. It's mind-blowing. It is. Yeah. Kara, what does this do for you? Well, the guy who started the Salvation Army, he said he wishes each one of his employees could be dangled over hell so they can, (laughs) you know, really (laughs) have a heart for the lost. The guy had to die in order to care about his friends that much. Hmm. We're alive, and uh, we have... The key to eternal life, and yet we keep it to ourselves. I mean, that's, I don't know, it just bothers me in that way. I just, that I want to shake people and go, you you have the cure for everything. Here's everything. I mean, the worst thing that can happen to us is the best thing that can happen to us. That's to die. Yeah. We are born, you know, just, it's frustrating. To think that there are people there just bothers me. Hate yeah, I remember meeting a, a woman from China who was preparing to be a missionary to go back to her village, and she had shared the gospel with uh, her sister, I believe it was, and her sister was so, for lack of a better word, offended by the gospel because what it did was it shook up her worldview so bad that she said, "Well, whoa, whoa, if I believe this, and if this is in fact true, that means all of our loved ones." Mm-hmm. Our ancestors who've been practicing all this religion are in hell. Hell is a horrible place. And because of that, 
I cannot believe it because everything else we pursued was false. But that's exactly what we need to do. We need to look at the reality of hell, allow it to scare us, to remind us to go out there and tell people the truth of it. You know, we get so passionate about anti-sugar, anti, you know, eggs because of cholesterol. And we'll tell people, don't eat the eggs, don't eat the eggs, don't use the, you know, whatever supplement. But the reality is we got to show them hell because right. that is an eternal consequence. But I think as Arnie, you talked about a little bit ago about the truth of this. Let's face it, relativism today is a big issue. The notion that truth is relative to an individual to a culture, to a religion, you name it, truth is relative. But from your perspective, how has relativism impacted the church? I think it's had tremendous impact because we don't talk about hell. We don't talk much about evil. We don't talk about the hard things so much. And it's just kind of... Um, you make your way, and you make your way the best you can spiritually, and it's just kind of mosey along. You know, this whole notion of relativism, I think it has impacted the church in monumental ways. As we've talked about today, it's impacting how people view hell and heaven. You know, is hell real or is it just the consequences we live in today? Relativism has impacted the church also in how we live. Right. Uh, hey, you know, it's probably good for you to avoid sexual morality. But for me, you know, because I'm forgiven, you know, it, it's OK. I'm covered by grace. We've let relativism really impact all of Christendom. And the reality is we need to end that today because truth is not relative. It is objective and it's found in God's word. It's found in God himself. And so we as believers need to come back to the Bible daily see what is truth, and live according to it, regardless of the consequences and the pushback we will experience today and tomorrow. Thank you for listening today. You know, here at Back to the Bible, your spiritual journey is our number one priority. That's why we offer so many biblical resources free of charge. Now, there are costs involved, and because of that, we're very excited about our September Challenge Grant. This grant doubles the impact of your gift through September 30th. So please call today, knowing that your donation will go twice as far. To show our thanks, we'll send you a copy of Moving Forward. This new fall issue features three months of daily devotions to keep you engaged and growing in God's Word. Request your copy today at 1-800-759-2425, 1-800-759-2425, or give online at backtothebible.org. Hey, Pastor Nat here. I just want to encourage you, no matter what you're facing today, to keep growing and going, and as always, stand firm, stand faithful, and stand on God's Word.